on today's Techno Babble. Different types of DSLR lenses and their uses. This is Tech No Babble, your weekly source for church video and graphics news, perspectives, tips, and tricks. And now, here's your host, Paul Clifford. Hi, everyone. This is Paul Allen Clifford. I'm your host here at uh, Techno Babble. Techno Babble is the weekly show where we talk about using video and graphic design in the church and I'd love your question so if you head on over to trinitydigitalmedia.com slash contact you can go ahead and ask those or just leave them in the comment bar below so DSLR lenses now what you may or may not know is that a DSLR here this is mine this is a Canon T3i that I don't have the lens on right now because I'm about to talk about it. If you're listening to the video, it doesn't really matter for this purpose. But I will be holding, I will be holding up these different lenses. Really, just the information counts. So let's start out with the first lens that I bought. I bought the kit lens, which is the 18 to 55 millimeter lens, f 3.5 to 5.6 image stabilization lens. This is a current model lens. You can pick this up just about anywhere. In fact, I got this one on eBay. And the reason that I got it on eBay is because the autofocus was broken and I saved a good amount of money on it. As a videographer, I prefer to focus on stuff myself. So I'll zoom in all the way, and then I'll focus, and then I'll zoom out. So that's how I would use this lens anyway. So I just don't use the autofocus. And on the T3i, you can't autofocus while it's live recording video anyway. So I really didn't see any good reason for having the autofocus. So I saved some money on that. Um, so <clears throat> let's talk about this lens. This is a zoom lens, meaning that it goes from uh, wide, in this case 18 millimeters, to telephoto, in this case 55 millimeters. Um, that's not particularly wide. It's not like a a fisheye lens or something like that and 55 millimeters isn't particularly close or particularly long so it's a good starting lens now I also mentioned the f-stop of 3.5 to 5.6 this is the first thing that you need to recognize about uh, DSLR lenses is sometimes they have a variable aperture so if you look at the pupil of your eye, the little black circle in the middle, that will open and close based on how much light there is in the room. And so that's how that works. Well, a DSLR lens also has that ability to open and close. But on some lenses, it can only open so far, depending on where you are in the focal length range. So, when it's zoomed in all the way, it can't open as wide as when it is all the way out. So that's the first thing that you should realize is some of these lenses, like this one, which is considered a very inexpensive lens, it's a good starter lens, while it can open up as wide as 3.5, f3.5 which is a measure of the ratio of how big it is to the size of the lens all you really need to know is the smaller the number the bigger the opening and the reason that's the case is you need to think of it as the denominator of a fraction the bottom number of a fraction so one half 
is a larger percentage than 1 16th, even though 2 is normally smaller than 16. Same way it works with uh, what's going on inside of the lens, that the wider it is, the narrower the aperture. So f16, for example, is a teeny tiny opening, and f3.5 in this case is a larger size opening. So the fact that this is 3.5 to 5.6 immediately tells me that it will go to 5.6 throughout the entire range, but as I get, as I zoom in, the ability to be wide in the aperture minimizes. So if I've got everything set perfectly for a shot when it's uh, wide, and then I zoom in, all of a sudden it's going to appear darker. So that's a little bit of a downside, and it's something for you to consider as you're looking at these lenses. This lens is predominantly plastic. It's got, of course, glass elements on the inside. That's what focused the light. But they've saved some money in the construction of this by making it plastic. So that is my 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens. The very next lens that I got was a zoom lens. Now, instead of buying an expensive zoom lens because I'm cheap and I don't have a lot of money, so those two things work well together, I bought a classic Canon lens. This is a 70 to 155, sorry, a 70 to 150 millimeter lens at, let's see if it says it on the front here, f4.5. So, it goes much farther. If you're watching the video, you can tell that you've got a very long lens. And it zooms, not by turning, but by pulling in and out. And what's great about these classic lenses is they have all the markings. This lens, really, the only marking it has is the telephoto marking, so I can know, okay, 18 is wide, 55 is zoomed in and I've got 24 and 35. Those are my sizes. So that's that tells me something about that. This, in addition to having the zoom as I pull this out, 70, 85, 100, 120, 150 millimeters, that tells me how far I'm zoomed in or out. It also has this marking around the barrel of the lens, either in green or in white. White is meters, green is feet. So this is when when I'm lined up to the subject, I can actually focus without using my eye just by measuring. So I could say, okay, the subject is 30 feet away, and I am <clears throat> and I am zoomed to 150 millimeters. So, with the lens not even connected to the camera, if it's the case that the subject is 30 feet from the focal point of the lens, and if it's the case that I'm zoomed into 150 millimeters, then it should be the case that I'm in focus, even with the lens not connected to the camera. I can know that. Now, as soon as I pop the lens onto the camera, I should be able to verify that, make any small tweaks that I can make. With the classic lens, a lot of times you'll also find this ring, which this is, this is the 
f-stop ring. So with a modern lens, you have to adjust that in the camera. With a classic lens, you can actually adjust that on the lens itself, which as a videographer, I actually prefer the ability to do that. If you're watching, so, uh, I'm going to try and set this up to where it's very obvious. You can see the ring opening and closing as I turn that. So that's, in my opinion, that's a good feature. I wish uh, the DSLR lens manufacturers hadn't abandoned that as a feature. Now though, there's no image stabilization and no autofocus on this lens whatsoever. It's not that I'm not using it, it's not that it's not it's not that it's broken, it just doesn't exist. Also this is a classic Canon lens, meaning it's an FD, if memory serves, mount, so I need a special adapter. And that special adapter is not a cheap adapter. Some adapters, like the one I'm about to show you here in just a second costs just a few dollars because it's basically a piece of metal cut the right way. This one, in addition to being a piece of metal, it also has an additional lens element in it. And that's because Canon, when they went from film cameras to DSLRs, they changed the distance between where the lens mounts and where the sensor is. So before, there was no sensor, it was just film. So that was a certain distance, and then they changed the distance when they went to the digital cameras. So that is something to keep in mind. In general, people don't tend to like to modify old Canon lenses to work on a Canon DSLR for that very reason, because you in effect, it zooms in more than it was. So if I had a wide lens, it would, in effect, lower its wideness, if you want to think of it this way. If I were to compare a current model lens to this lens, and I was comparing a Canon 5D Mark II, which is a full-frame sensor, the sensor is the same size as a 35 millimeter piece of film, a uh, frame of film. If I was comparing that versus this lens on my T3i, which is what's called a crop filter. While I told you that this is a 70 by 150 zoom lens, in effect, because of the adapter and because of the crop filter, uh, crop factor, because the sensor is smaller. In effect, what I get is an image that is twice as large. So really what I'm dealing with, for all intents and purposes, is a 140 to 300 lens, which if I'm shooting sports or something like that where I, I need to get really up into the action, that's good. But if I thought that I wasn't, that I'd be covering the range of my zoom, it's really not good because this is my medium range lens, the kit lens, and it is 18 to 55. This is a 70 to 140 lens. And even removing the crop factor between the two lenses, the difference because of that additional lens element in the Canon lens makes it more like about 90 millimeters. So even comparing apples to apples, I jump from 55 millimeter to 90 millimeters, about. I haven't done the math in, on paper, but I'm just guesstimating here. So there is a gap in my lenses where I have as wide as 18 millimeters and as close as about 300 millimeters, but there is a gap between 55 millimeters and about 90 millimeters that I really should fill. 
Now, there is another kind of lens. Those are both zoom lenses, so they zoom in and out, uh, and that's probably what you're familiar with. This is a prime lens. What a prime lens is, is it's a lens that does not zoom in and out. So a prime lens <coughs> allows you to um, do one thing better than zoom lenses, and that is prime lenses tend to have a wider aperture, or a smaller F number. In this case, this lens, which again isn't a Canon lens, this is actually an adapted Vivitar lens, goes down to, it says 1.9, but that's a non-standard number, so let's just call it 1.8. So, this goes to f1.8, which is very wide. Here, let me, yeah, that is there. Let me take off the back piece, and that's very wide now. You can watch me stomp it down to very narrow. I'm trying to get the light just right. Got a filter on this lens to keep it from scratching. So that is wide down to narrow. Wide, narrow. Or f1.8 down to f16. So that is the advantage of the prime lens. The disadvantage is if what I'm seeing is too big, I've got to move in closer, physically move in closer. If what I'm seeing is too narrow, because this is a 50 millimeter lens, so it's about the same as my kit lens zoomed not all the way out, but pretty close to all the way out. If if this is too uh, too small of a an image, I need to move back. I cannot use this lens in my home studio, for example, because I normally want a larger image of myself when I'm shooting. And if I were to use this, I would get a shot very similar to what you're seeing on the screen if you're watching the video, which is head and shoulders. And so that is coming from a webcam that is, I don't know, two, three feet from me, to get that same shot, I would have to be across the room from this lens. So that is a bit of a problem with this lens. So lenses are all about trade-offs. So it's deciding in what case do I need this lens, in what case do I need that lens. Oh, and I forgot to mention that the the adapter for this Vivitar lens is very inexpensive, just a few dollars. And that is, you heard me unscrewing it, that is because it's basically just a piece of metal. It's a piece of metal made where on one side it has the, uh, the screw mount for the Vivitar lens, and on the other side it has the bayonet type mount for the Canon lens. So. It goes on really easily, and it doesn't have any glass in it whatsoever, and I just leave that on there. So I have these three lenses. One other thing that I haven't mentioned about lenses, as you're looking at them, because there are some times where you look and you say, well, this particular lens is like $500 cheaper from that lens, but all the numbers are the same. What's the difference? sharpness. Some lenses are designed to get a better focus than others. So you can really zoom in and really get the details really, really well on one lens. And that tends to be the more expensive lens. And another lens will, you'll zoom in all the way and you'll get adequate focus but adequate and really good are different, so that's why one lens that is very inexpensive will be very inexpensive compared to another lens that's very expensive when all the other features seem identical and you think, well, 
this is a no-brainer. I'll just go with the cheaper one. Not necessarily, because it just doesn't quite focus well as well. Sometimes you have to make do with what you've got, and it, if that's the case, then that's the case. But consider that as you're looking at these different lenses. Now, these lessons also apply to video cameras. A lot of video cameras do not have interchangeable lenses, but you can do some research as you're looking at, let's say you've got three different cameras that you're looking at buying, and <clears throat> one of them has a variable f-stop. Depending on your situation, maybe you don't want that. One of them maybe goes particularly wide, but doesn't zoom in as much. Perhaps that may or may not be the one that you want. Maybe the third one zooms in really well, but it doesn't go as wide. Again, something to consider. So the, the higher the number on the zoom, the closer you will apparently be to the subject. That's not absolutely the case. It's not the case that it just gets bigger. It also compresses the background making the background look like it's closer to the subject. But, with that said, the so if you have a video camera that has a 150 millimeter lens, you're going to get a much larger subject in the on this the screen than if you had a 35 millimeter lens. Do you see how that works? Now there are ways of getting around that and things that help you adapt that, but I want you to remember this as you're shopping for camcorders, as you're shopping for cameras, that it really, it can matter. Now if you're just a point and shoot, don't worry about it, thing, uh, person, just keep it in mind. Because it could be that if you're doing landscapes, you'll want a wider image. If you're doing a lot of people in a small area, you'll want wider. If you're doing th shooting things that are far away, you'll want a longer lens, more zoom. If you tend to shoot in less light, you'll want a larger aperture, and when you get a larger aperture, you also get better depth of, or a more shallow depth of field. So you get that bokeh effect where things are all fuzzy in the background and it looks really good. And keep in mind that you can have this variable f-stop lens where it might, when you're wide, you might think, oh, this is perfect, and then you zoom in and it's not anymore. So you have to make other changes. So I hope that those help you as you're looking for cameras, as you're looking for lenses, as you're thinking about the different things that you should use um, as you're looking for a camera. This is Paul Allen Clifford with TrinityDigitalMedia.com and I hope this information helps you and your church go out and change eternity.